So Shaheen is a curator and, write, and writer based in London who explores the intersection of art, culture, identity, and global histories. Before, before he was a key lecturer at Central St. Martin's School of Art, he was a visiting lecturer and researcher at the University of West, Westminster and the head of department of exhibitions, film, and new media at the Haus der Kulturen der Welt in Berlin, where he curated exhibitions accompanied by publications. He was the co-curator of the sixth Wangju Biennale in Korea and co-curator of Berlin, has to the enduring fascination of Walled City for the fourth Mediation Biennial in Poznan in Poland. So we would like to welcome Shaheen Merali. <laughs> And, uh, and now for something completely different, as Monty Python used to say, um, <laughs> which literally means that uh, what just preceded me was incredibly intense, full of very large mega perspectives, um, and also from a very specific, well, I felt a very specific approach to how problems are situated, looked, confined, realized, uh, and then disseminated. And I'm really coming from a very specific area of how I look at the world, what turns me on, what I find important, in a sense, to my own ability to see and function in this world. And that's really coming from the fact that I was a practicing artist who then ended up working specifically as a curator and then trying to work out and think through some of the ways that art is observed, realized, read, and how it functions in our life. And I've sort of talked, I, I wanted to talk about, in, in a strange way, a very old saying, and this is the reason I used this as a title for my talk, who assimilates for whom? And when I started thinking about this as, a, as, a, as an idea, who assimilates for whom, uh, it's a very old traditional Chinese saying. Um, it also came to me that it was important to maybe draw upon a limited amount of resources to try and work out how I can talk about who assimilates for whom, because it could be anything about anything. So I'm only going to talk about four artists' works, and I'm also going to talk about one exhibition specifically, which made me feel that I should look at an architectural exhibition in relationship to artistic practice. And that was the, the time when I was in attending specifically the fundamentals part of Rem Kulhaus's Architectural Biennale in 2014. What was interesting about that exhibition was that the research was about spaces defining elements, or three spaces that defined elements, which was the floor, the wall, and the ceiling, and two functioning spaces which was the window and the toilet. And so there were very specific ways to look at it. I had never come across something so where the curatorial division was incredibly, uh, maybe evaluatory, but also strange. And many people received this particular way of looking at the world, um, especially in the press, in the press as this was a ch not a challenge to how we view the wider community, but it's a challenge to how we view houses and ourselves within spaces. So it was more about where is that rapid development which we talk about as rapid urbanization within all of this? Where is the notion of the political context riding on all of this? And some people were very, very critical about this arrangement at the Architecture Biennale. I'm sorry, this is a bit difficult. Now, some people said that it is no longer possible to tell the difference between what he advocates 
and what he criticizes in this arrangement. Um, each room is obsessively like a series of retweets. This was a, an observation made of how he was trying to talk about space. But I sort of turn to someone like Susan Sontag when it comes to trying to work out what is really possible to look at in, by simplifying or resolving ideas which are sometimes intermashed and intertrapped. And she says, it's really good sometimes to return as a return to origins. Simpler is in the great forgetting. Because we forget how some, some, sometimes some, something very simple can hold all the fundamental values and ideas which we want to build upon, look at. So I turn back to who assimilates for whom. The ar architectural sort of community is like the art community, filled with bitter sort of tinges when it comes to anybody exploring spaces or exploring ideas, they tend to, like everywhere else, purge and massacre theses as they appear in exhibitions or they appear in the context of formulating a, a, a dialogue. The Biennale format especially has become a format which has more and more become a place where the press gets involved in such a large cohesive manner, and sometimes that critical honesty, which they talk about as critical honesty, is blatant, abusive, intentional hurting. And for instance, Okwi is on Inverso's 56th uh, International Venice Biennale, or the world's future. Somebody said, more of a glum trudge than exhilarating adventure. Now, you know, you feel really run down by some of these things which happen in the way that exhibition spaces, ideas are evaluated in the public. Kuhlhaas's fundamental was, to a certain extent, about guiding principles, about media and spaces, about how, to a certain extent, we should not always have everything swollen with hype. It's sometimes important to think about specificities, and also about maybe abstractions of specificities. Artists often who are involved in biennales or in large-scale exhibitions are deterred from participating in some of these vehicles only because they get their, their, their personal integrity and positions get butchered, gets butchered in this carnage that happens in the press. It's often difficult for them to think through how should they carry on working in this institutionalized critique, but also institutional spaces of the media, which criticizes such vehemently artistic endeavors and ex experiments, that's all they are. Artists are making experiments in public spaces. So I was thinking about why do artists choose, in a sense, to work away from gallery spaces, biennale formats, and why do they choose to work in non-spaces? What is it that drives them? And partly it is the fact that they don't want to be curtailed by that circus that follows these large-scale formats. And in that sense, I was very interested in thinking through Kuhlhaas's idea about the walls for this particular talk. I was also interested in, in some ways in what Susan Sontag had once said about the wall, which was, she said, she wrote a book called A Project Trip to China, which was actually a, a, an interesting imaginary trip to China. And she said, I'm interested in wisdom, but I'm also interested in walls. And China is famous for both of them. <laughs> and it was kind of interesting to think through how she was thinking about spaces as well as um, 
the idea of visiting China. This is prior, this is in the 1980s. It was really a long time ago. I was interested in, 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 in the models of the Chinese historic buildings from the Dutch museums, which were in uh, one of the guiding principles for Cool House Fundamental in the wall section. I was interested in that because it chose to display those walls as an examination of the idea of the wall as an infancy and its kind of ride its architectural, to its architectural adulthood. It really was very simple in, that, in those sort of terms that it became important for me. So it was, it was about the discipline's innovation, but also evolution, which was, was there, evident, very much evident there. It provided a kind of form of catalog, as, cataloging aspects of the urban mundane. It was an, exposed as a quest for how we wanted to remain in the sort of the domicile sphere. It was about human necessity. It was about a steadiness. It was also about our benevolence to biology and to geography. There were many aspects to it, but it was also about giving us a perspective and a perception how we have approached our own condition of where we find ourselves within the walls. What walls are, how they have constructed us. Of course, there were times when you walked around this exhibition, you were completely confounded by what was around you. You felt, to a certain extent, I've, I've seen so many, much of this in my life. Why am I having to pay to come in and have to look at it all over again? But it was the manner that it also allowed the fluctuation of taste, the idea of lifestyles which, have been, which we call bygone, to a certain extent. How we confront, to a certain extent, what inspired these innovations? What was it? that was the thinking behind the original commissioners of these walls. However, going back to a certain extent to the artist, and the artists who always are there, artists casually come in and they study walls. And they often study floors as well. Because artists, of course, are citizens, but they're also always looking for potential venues. And then they come back after this period of study and resuming, engaging the same fundaments to become, to make works of art, to become spatial connoisseurs, to become performers within the spaces. They turn the spaces. So it was interesting for me to see this as a fundamental, but also how the fundamentals speak so loudly to a certain group of people that allows them to think through to create specific works, specific ideas, and specific interventions. I worked in this building. I realized when I worked in this particular building what cannot be done to each wall. It was very difficult to work in this space. You had to be innovative. You had to be reminded constantly you cannot put a nail there, or you can use a nail which had been used here before, but you can't put a new one in. You know, so you had to be guarded by its history, but also had to reflect on its reality, its, its heritage. So what I'm going to talk about now is how the wall, this, this fundamental structure, this fundament, is to be found in four artists' works. These artists themselves have a fascination, or have had a fascination, in one or two pieces of their works with the idea of the wall. And what I want to try and do is to think about what can we learn from those works and how those walls became important at that particular time in their work, in that specific geopolitical scenario that we find the work in. The first piece of work I want to talk about is a piece called Deadpan by the uh, filmmaker Steve McQueen. It's an early piece made in 1997. And some of you might have not seen it, most of you might not have seen it, but that doesn't matter to a certain extent because the references that it holds will become very clear to you as I speak about them. It's a seminal piece of work for Steve McQueen. Um, and Steve McQueen is the, the director who made 12 Years a Slave, which, which won the Oscar. Dead Pan is a short video piece which was inspired by a scene from the 1928 Buster Keaton film um, the slapstick film about uh, Steamboat, Steamboat Bill Jr., uh, which you might recognize from this still. 
It's a still where, from the film which became very famous, where a house falls apart and Keaton, who is standing there, gets, is saved because he falls, or he's exactly in the same space as the window. So he doesn't die from the collapse. So the main character is secure, even when the facade crashes down around him. It's about luck, but it's also about naivety. Um, you know, the open window somehow hits the ground and he comes out of it, still feeling great. The same piece of, uh, let me just show you the next slide. Yeah. This is the still from the video by Steve McQueen, Deadpan. He remakes and casts him, himself in the starring role. But unlike Keaton, who is a small man in a large landscape, um, the artist in this particular video piece captures the sequence not only in different shots, but also where you see him unmoving, completely unflinched in this video work. So in the last, in, in, in the Keaton piece, as soon as he realizes he's still alive, he runs away thinking, wow, I'm lucky, fantastic. You know, there's an, a remarkable slapstick reality that comes to, rea uh, to, to play in, in this piece. In the McQueen piece, he stoically just stands there and the house keeps on falling on him and keeps on falling on him and keeps on falling on him because he's on a loop. Now, what is it, in a sense, that allowed the time of making of Steamboat Bill Jr. for him to have that relationship to this particular scenario where he feels lucky, feels, feels the ability to just walk away from it knowing the gods are with him, and what happens to uh, Steve McQueen, where he feels this is a repetition, this is a loop, I'm going to be there here forever, caught in this window, which is going to have the facade falling around me. That liter literal absence of expression, in many ways, can be read as a kind of a silent witness to the time that McQueen finds himself. And I want to talk a bit more about that, the time that this work was made and the time that it takes sometimes for a work of an art by an artist for us to come to terms with it. It's not that something is made at a certain point and we realize it's might, it's weight, or it's, or, or it's uh, uh, ability to overcome and understand and overstand realities. It takes time sometimes for us also to understand what is being said. In another work, piece of work, which I'm going to quickly mention before I return back to uh, McQueen's work, is the theme of the war plays out again, and that is Gordon Mata Clark's conical uh, intersect, which was actually executed in 1975. And if you are aware of, uh, oops, we don't have it here. All right, we do. Do, you, do you know about Gordon Mata Clark's work, by the way? Are you aware of his work, yeah? Gordon Mata Clark was uh, a, a very important artist, uh, an American artist, who in, in uh, 1975 um, took over a Parisian apartment and, in a sense, challenged what he did in it as a notion of failure, uh, especially the notion of 20th century failure. What he realized, and he, he, he was very important in uh, allowing us to understand, is that we remained impoverished by the way that we produce from the ruins different contexts. And what I mean by that is that the building which were going to be broken in Paris were making way for the Pompidou Center. So, in a funny way, what he was doing was making explicit that which was to come might be culture, but what I'm making out of the ruins is also culture. <clears throat> 
And it was about the notion of the city becoming much more of a destination, a cultural theme, cultural hub. And that cultural hub keeps on playing up in a number of these artists' works. So what he did was he took over an abandoned apartment in Paris. And melancholically, he cut into this apartment round holes, in a sense, disclosing from within these ruins the outside space. It was seen as a very important work because, in many ways, he was exper experimenting with the idea of reimagining maybe the reenchantment of this building, maybe arguing about taking over it to produce a space to stop its inevitable downfall. Maybe he was making a contemporary cultural commentary or a reaction about the constant destruction and the instant renewal, which was the sort of post-war modality idea, towards his rise, towards his necessity, towards providing high-rise apartments, buildings, or office complexes. Both McQueen and Matter Clark were very interested in maybe allowing us to think about the idea of the wall, the house, the facade as a place where we have often and are looking for shelter and to think through how impermanent shelters have started to become in the contemporary condition. And also in that, we then have to look at and locate the idea that how impoverished we are at the moment with our notion of cultural memory. What disappears and is replaced doesn't necessarily remain part of our wider brief, wider idea of ourselves or an aspect of our identity. Symbolically for me, these two pieces of work by Matta Clark and Steve McQueen also represent that very particular <coughs> moment that Charles Jenks talked about when uh, the modern world died, and he said it died at 3.32 p.m. on the 15th of July, 1972, with a demolition of a building um, called the Pruitt Ego Housing Scheme in St. Louis, Missouri. This was a very large urban housing project which was first occupied in 1954 and was designed by an architect called Minori Yamasaki who also designed the World Trade Center's towers. And it's a strange history that two of the designs by the same architect are destroyed within his lifetime. What Charles Jenks suggests is that after the death of modernity, in a sense, we have a funless fascination with the cross-fertilization from different eras brought about what we've, what we've termed the postmodern and late capitalism. Turning back with that thought in our mind, Going back to Keaton, his lucky break, in a funny way, we can turn to Steve McQueen and say, maybe Keaton's lucky break has become a traumatic collision for, in, a, in a strange way for us at the time that we live through Steve McQueen. Because around that time, um, and if we look at those two pieces of work, and we look at its relationship, and this is an extension of my thinking, is that to a certain extent, the idea of urbanization is also about a kind of rapid dominance. It's not necessarily just about something growing, it's about how it dominates us, and the rapidity, the velocity that has happened especially in the global form. That idea of rapid dominance to a certain extent is known as shock and O. It's a tactic known as shock and O. 
Of course, the way that we found out about shock and awe is when a doctrine was written by uh, Ullman and Wade in 1996, which was then adopted to be uh, the treaties through which the Gulf War began in 1990. And he continued, of course, as the war on terror and now is as the war on insurgency. If you remember, uh, there was a general Norman Shokoff and Colin Powell who were involved. Um, they actually employed the idea of shock and awe from an early treatise by the Chinese military strategist Sun Tzu, which was in 500, 544 to 496 BC, where he had talked about in his book, The Art of War, that you can get anywhere you want if you provide a process to demoralize people by deception, by speed, and strike to destroy the will of the adversary to resist. So when we look at this idea of shock and awe, although we know it as what was applied in terms of military strategy by the decapitation of military targets, it can also be used to decapitate societal targets to achieve the same goal, which is destruction and replacement. Of course, the idea of shock and awe has been used for a very long time. It's nothing new. It's been part of the Western and Eastern canon in the way that urban policies, for instance, um, including security and urban designs and many of the other strategies of fear that you were implementing for us um, are provided earlier on. It was a fantastic how things, we are living in times of such fear, such shock, such awe. And I would argue that piece by Steve McQueen is about that relationship to shock and awe. What does shock and awe do? Well, it kind of exhumes you. It leaves you like ground zero. You can't flinch in it. You are, you are disallowed to react. The ground zeros of Nagasaki and Hiroshima, the rice fields in Vietnam, and the German Blitzkrieg, they're all traditional, traditional sort of areas where Western discomfort has left them, <coughs> sorry, I'll, I'll go back to that later on, has left us in a same, similar position as how Steve McQueen finds himself. What I'm asking you to do here is that contemporary artwork has a possibility for you to have multiple interpretations to it. It's not something which is self-regulated. It is to be regulated by all of us in how we approach it, how we read it, how we find a condition for it to breathe, to be with us. It is boundless, it is informed, and it doesn't have just tangible, it also has intangible connotations. In certain, certain times like this, where there is such utter decimation, and we are discouraged as much as feel encouraged, but we're discouraged so often. We cannot afford, in this moment, to flinch in midst of this trauma, but I would argue we need to be able to interrupt what is going on around us. I was gonna go through other works, but I'm going to stop and, and conclude because I've only got five minutes left. In a strange way, what I wanted to say today by looking at all of this work was we are receiving, we are re in, in a sense, living in an era which is, can be described as a vacuum. Um, there's a concept of states, there's a hegemony out there, which in a, in a funny way even has disallowed us up to now to talk about ideas about human greed. We haven't been allowed to discuss why we've got where we've got so, so quickly. Um, and of course, what is happening naturally is even further away from us as, as part of our reality. We don't, we don't find ourselves naturally part of the, the, the questions of catastrophe, like the weather, the, the, 
the earth, you know, it's the urban discourse we're involved in, the, the larger discourses we don't find ourselves um, part of. But I'm going to sort of conclude by suggesting two things here. It's a much larger paper. I'm sorry to say I'm not able to, to, to do much, much of it. Jacques Rancière argued in his, um, in his book, Disagreement, Politics and Philosophy, that both politics and policy act as police. And his idea, which was very interesting for us to think through, or his focal point was the concept, the concept of a break about this sensual uh, politics with strategic interruption of the hegemonic sensible, yeah? Or otherwise, why do we remain, why do we remain marginalized, both in discourse and as people and as communities? Who renders us marginalized? And who are the privileged who have the power to do that? He suggests the politics of change comes solely if we somehow intervene through interruption. He suggests in, in many ways that we need to stage disagreements. We cannot just disagree, we have to stage disagreements. And I believe certain artists have been doing that historically and carry on doing that. And it depends on how we read into a certain work. What is it? Even at the time, for instance, that this piece of work was made, just to give it a tiny bit of background, it was the year when the first World Trade Tower was bombed. It was the year when El Nino was recognized as a world uh, event, a major world event. It was the year when Timothy McQuee was jailed as the first homegrown lone wolf terrorist. You could read this work in, in relationship to all of those events and bring to an idea, why does this artist make that in relationship to all of those works? In the same way, a number of artists are making works which are strategic interruptions of society that no longer renders them invisible. It allows them, to a certain extent, to stage a disagreement. And in staging and interrupting the current or the currency, in a sense, it short circuits what is around it, even for that moment, whether it's the social order or the hegemonic sensible or sensitivity. In a strange way, artists do establish and work within the fabric of policies and the fabric of politics within the relationships that structures all of that. But what they also are very good at is meandering, meandering like a river. A river, if it finds a rock, it goes around it. Meandering around the politics of truth that we have been given. We somehow end up believing that this is the truth. What they do, to a certain extent, through their work and how we should be able to read that work, is look at the politics of appearances. What appears before us? And in, in that sense, in our reading, in our ability to analyze it, what is a necessary action that we can envisage working with the community, through it, with it? Just a couple of seconds more, yeah? Rancia suggests this idea of turning, which is also very interesting. How do you turn what you find yourselves within the hegemonic, within the sensible? How do you use a process of devaluing what you think is a misunderstanding or how misunderstanding is represented as facts? How do you create out of that a counter-hegemonic sensibility? So these ideas of disagreement, these ideas of, of countering, the so dominant distribution of ideas, of a sensibility, is about reconfiguration, but it's also about our, in a sense, education, how to read, 
within the politics of appearances rather than the politics of truth. I believe artists such as McQueen, Matta Clark, I was going to talk about Zhang Dali from Beijing and Lina Kajraval from India today, which I didn't, um, provide a co coherency into the very, very, fabric society, very fabric of society which we understand as political activity. Polit political activity is not only about going out there, but it's also about making specific type of images, presenting them, and allowing them to exist in an active manner. Rancia, and I'm en ending with this quote from him, says, artists, designers, thinkers, should make us understand a discourse what was only heard once as a, as a noise. So in a sense, we are the transmitters within this reality. I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you.